the officer asked for their license and registration. No one responded. After asking again, the man in the back seat said something in Spanish to the driver. The driver then handed the officer a passport. After running the information, the officer told the driver to drive carefully, to which he received no response. The next day, the officer was surprised to find out that the two front passengers of the car were 37-year-old Yves Emmanuel Pan and his friend, 24-year-old Laurent Danaz. Both men had been reported missing at sea, and the Coast Guard had been searching for them for over a month. Yves and Laurent were French sailors who had been hired to deliver a French-made sailboat to new owners. In October 1991, they began a 2,500-mile voyage from Annapolis, Maryland to Guadeloupe in the West Indies. The boat was a state-of-the-art catamaran worth $200,000. The design made it virtually unsinkable and undetectable by radar. When the vessel failed to arrive on schedule, the Coast Guard was notified. Several sightings of them were reported miles off of their intended course on the intercoastal waterway. Witnesses reported seeing a third man on the boat, suggesting that it may have been hijacked. A third man was not supposed to be on board, but he was sighted by at least five different witnesses. According to these witnesses, the man did not appear to be threatening, which led some to believe the sailors had also been involved in stealing the boat. Their families and friends do not believe they would ever be involved in illegal activity. A friend of Yves is convinced the stranger hijacked the boat, keeping the two sailors on board to sail it. Nearly two months later, when the three were pulled over in South Carolina, it's possible that the third passenger was holding them hostage from the back seat of the car. Another theory is that the French sailors unintentionally sailed into Cuban waters and are being held in prison. Next is the case of George Allen Smith IV. In 2005, newlyweds George and Jennifer Smith were on a two-week honeymoon cruise going from Greece to Turkey. One night, halfway through the cruise, the couple went to dinner and then to the casino at 1am. They began drinking, with both becoming intoxicated. They were in good spirits and seemed to be acting normally, although maybe a little rowdy. While at the casino, George met up with a friend he had made on the trip, named Josh Askin. He was teaching him to play craps. Josh's friends, Zachary and Greg, joined them with another friend, Rusty. This was apparently interrupted when George noticed a cruise ship employee was getting unusually close with his wife. Witnesses later said that a creepier named Lloyd Botar had been showing Jennifer a lot of attention as the night went on. A fellow cruise ship employee said that the nature of their relationship was not known to him, but that what he had seen certainly went beyond professional boundaries. 
shortly after the men were seen helping George out of the disco. The five men walked back to George and Jennifer's room, but when George saw that Jennifer was not there, he became annoyed and set off to search for her. The other men later said they waited in the room until George returned and continued to drink. Cleet Hyman, the man staying in the room next to George and Jennifer, reported there was loud noises coming from their room around 3 a.m. He said it sounded like a party or loud card game. Josh, Greg, Zack and Rusty claim they left George alone in his room shortly after this complaint was made. Cleet Diamond says he saw only three men leave the room at that time through his peephole. Then, within a few minutes, he heard a loud thud, assuming someone had knocked something over or drunkenly fallen over. Jennifer was bound, passed out, lying in a hallway in another area of the ship by crew members, and was helped back to her room around 5 a.m. She said George was not there, and she slept for a few hours before going to a massage appointment. When questioned about this lack of concern for her husband, Jennifer explained they had both slept in other rooms at different times of the cruise, so she assumed he had spent the night somewhere else. While she was out, bloodstains were found on the canopy of a lifeboat beneath the room's balcony and also on the side of the ship. It was at this time it was discovered George was no longer on board. It appeared he might have been tossed off the ship or fallen overboard and drowned. Police suspected homicide. Jennifer claims to not remember much of the night and no one has admitted to knowing what happened to George. Some believed he was shoved overboard by the men from the casino, while others believe he became disoriented and fell. Investigations continued until 2012. The New York Post reported it had been referred to the Mafia Division of the FBI. TV program Dateline indicated the theory of a robbery gone bad. Jennifer remarried four years after and was criticized, particularly by George's family, for her behavior on that night. She believes it was an accident caused by her late husband's intoxication. Others theorized it was suicide due to Jennifer allegedly cheating on him during the cruise. In 2006, she accepted a $1.1 million compensation from the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. Next is the KC Nicole. On April 10, 1990, 
Sure. 
Search team found the Dakar on the seabed. 
Soviet submarine. To ensure this attempt remained secret, the CIA, instead of the Navy, was asked to conduct the operation. The Hughes Goyma Explorer ship was designed and built on the CIA solely for this task. The cover story was it would be mining manganese nodules on the seafloor. The operation, named Project Azorian, was one of the most expensive and deepest secrets of the Cold War. The ship traveled 3,000 miles from Long Beach, California, to reach the recovery site. Details of what exactly was retrieved is classified top secret, but the Soviets assumed that the U.S. recovered torpedoes with nuclear warheads, operation manuals, code books, and coding machines. One theory of what happened was that a fail-safe device caused two catastrophic explosions, which was monitored at the time by the U.S. And the remains of the USS Scorpion submarine are reportedly resting on the seabed in the North Atlantic Ocean. Ninety-nine crew members were lost with that submarine. The Navy has extensively investigated it. The conclusion remained that an unexplained, catastrophic event occurred. Theories include accidental firing of a torpedo, a hydrogen explosion during battery charge, structural damage, or a Soviet attack. Next is Marion Carver. Forty-year-old Marion Carver was a poet and investment banker. She disappeared from a Royal Caribbean cruise in August 2004. Marion boarded the Mercury, one of their celebrity cruise ships, going on a seven-day cruise from Seattle, Washington, to Alaska. The steward, Domingo Montero, found her to be personable, relaxed, and looking forward to the cruise. She told him she planned to go upstairs later, but did not want to go to the dining room. When she mentioned the same the following night, he suggested ordering room service, then brought her two sandwiches at her request. That was the last known sighting of Marion. When Domingo checked on Marion's cabin the next morning, a bed had not been slept in. A generous tip and a manila envelope with unknown contents had been left behind, along with all of her belongings, including her only pair of shoes. Domingo reported her missing right away and continued to do so for the remaining five days of the cruise. His supervisor told him to just do your job and forget it. At the end of the cruise, they simply boxed up her belongings and disposed of most of the items. They made no attempt to contact the police or Marion's family. Royal Caribbean did contact the FBI, but not until five weeks later. Meanwhile, Marion's daughter, who lived with her dad, was concerned when she couldn't reach her mother by phone. She contacted Marion's father, 
meaning she would have been in her underwear. Marion did not use the cruise ship's currency card during the two days she was on board. A former crew member contacted her father and told him Marion had been having a relationship with another unidentified crew member. Marion's dad eventually filed a lawsuit against Royal Caribbean. The case went to trial in 2005, which was when he finally saw a copy of the security report, which he felt clearly indicated a cover-up. He was lied to about the surveillance footage, which had been kept for one month, not three days. So there should have still been footage when he first contacted them. During the trial, the cruise line released an official statement to the media claiming that Marion had severe emotional problems and appears to have committed suicide on her ship. But the steward, Domingo, insisted she did not seem upset or angry. Marion's father won the lawsuit, but unfortunately passed away in 2019 without ever finding out what happened to Marion. One thing many may not know is that American cruise ships that sail under foreign flags allows them to circumvent U.S. laws and taxes. When a crime is committed on a cruise ship, it is rarely investigated properly or promptly reported. An average of 10 Americans disappear from cruise ships every year. Next is Bermisha Island. There are many islands that were recorded on earlier maps, but which no longer exist. These are known as Phantom Islands. Most are thought to have never existed in the first place and were mistakenly identified. However, for some, it's not so clear what happened. Bermuda Island was recorded on many maps from the 16th up to the 20th century lying in the Gulf of Mexico. Later, in a 1997 survey, it could not be found. This island would have been important for determining the boundaries for Mexico and in oil drilling agreements with the US. Explanations for its disappearance include shifts in the ocean floor or natural erosion. Other theories claim that the CIA destroyed the island to expand the economic zone of the US. Next is the Gulf of Mexico shipwreck. In 2001, oil workers were laying pipeline when they discovered a shipwreck 2,600 feet deep on the seabed. The ship was upright and mostly intact, estimated to have been built between the years 1800 and 1830. A team was assembled to explore the wreckage. They attempted to get closer to the wreck and see if they could retrieve any artifacts. This is when they began to run into problems. Several attempts to send a robotic submarine to the shipwreck failed. The hydraulic system stopped working. The docking mechanism 
Amphipods are crustacean 